what up everybody and welcome to the nerd generation once again uh it's finally here it's finally time to discuss this movie uh the batman and uh really dive dive deep into this film and uh, talk about the stuff that we liked we didn't like but first of all we're gonna um talk about overall the our reaction to the film um we're gonna get uh into some technical discuss discussions but again we're not experts but we like certain things about a movie and i and i think we can certainly talk about some of the uh, the direction of the film the visual sound music and all that stuff then we're going to get into the characters and the elements of this film um and really talk about the stuff that we enjoyed from each of these performances and, and, and again the elements gotham being more specific then we'll talk about the potential of a 2023 Oscar run, maybe. Brian, I definitely see some, some awards already. You can just give it to them now and save time. Uh, but others, I, I, we'll talk about that. Um, again, our biggest criticism and disappointments. And then where do we want to go? Where do we want this story to go from here? Obviously, we saw it uh, wasn't necessarily an end credit scene but a scene that um very interestingly i i read about that there is a behind the scene well not a behind the scene but it was filmed and it never made the movie right brian we'll talk about that right okay. um and then we'll give our ratings uh so first of all I'm, again once again i'm your host pablo and joining me as always is mr brian shows brian do you want to go first and give me I'll give the the, the 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 fans out here uh your overall reaction of the film you want me to go first you want to go um let's do some numbers first because we actually okay. have numbers so let's let's start with that because i think that's an important part of the discussion here uh so preliminary box office for the batman directed by matt reeves starring robert pattinson as bruce wayne 128.5 million domestic, 248.5 million global. I would bet you that these numbers are revised higher. Uh, I think this movie has enough positive buzz that you'll see the Sunday number come up. I think you'll probably see north of 130, north of 250 as an opening weekend. That is excellent for a first run movie that is three hours long, that is yeah. as dark as this movie is. I would bet you that Warner Brothers is doing cartwheels uh, yes. over the success of this film, knowing that they have China coming in a couple of weeks. They've got Japan coming next weekend. Uh, and there is literally no tentpole competition coming from any other major studio until Morbius uh, in early April and uh, the next Fantastic Beasts movie, uh, the, the, the Mysteries of Dumbledore, I forget what they call it. Those are yes. kind of in the second week of April. So you kind of have a four week run here where this film, which went off kind of mid eighties, Rotten Tomatoes, but I want to get into that underrated. Actually, the people who like this movie gave it as high scores as I've ever seen critics yeah. give to this genre. Like, so if they gave it fresh rating, they were giving it five out of five, yeah. nine out of 10. It wasn't like six out of 10. Yeah, eh, yeah. It's okay. Positive. Um, the audience score, A minus cinema score grade, 90% plus audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. That is excellent. Uh, by comparison, um, in the Snyderverse, uh, Dawn of Justice and Justice League were both kind of like B, B minus. Mm -hmm. uh, now, a Man of Steel, in fairness, was A minus, so same same level there. But uh, but it, it, everything here sets up for a good run. So I think you're not going to see. I mean, we talked about really huge numbers probably not going to happen but i definitely yeah. think this thing will challenge that billion dollar level and if china which hasn't had a superhero movie shown in kind of over a year because the marvel releases never made it there you get a little pent-up demand there i think you kind of see this in that joker you know maybe takes a run at aquaman if it's really hot overseas but you're probably looking at a movie that's going to make 350 to 400 million domestic and yeah. like i said could make 500 to 700 million overseas i mean that's outstanding i mean that just that just says everything you need to know i think about how the world feels about this movie and where we're yeah. headed with this so that's where we're at on the numbers uh and let's get into it i don't know i'll go first if you want i don't care you can go first i don't care you 
You should go first because yeah. your hype level for this movie oh, redefined yeah. what hype was for a movie. So I think you should actually just take the stage. So listen, everybody knows who has spoken to me about this film and whom I've spoken to about this film. And if you've watched the show enough, know that, you know, I was really, really excited for this film. I was already singing his praises. When this, when this movie was first announced, I was already saying that this movie was going to be the best Batman we've ever seen on film ever, that it was going to be different and it will begin something, which it has the Batverse. Um, so yeah, for me, this movie delivered on those aspects, the best Batman film I've ever seen, or we've ever seen, in my opinion, um, the best Batman portrayal. Um, Bruce Wayne is a different story, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I thought it was going to make gangbusters loads of money. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I still think it's going to make a billion dollars. I, I just don't think it's going to, you know, reach those two billion dollar numbers that I was talking about because <laughs> I was super hype and I felt like you know people were gonna come out for this but um uh, the three hours is a little bit excessive and uh you know and and how dark this film is definitely um hurt it a, a bit but um regardless to me I was very very pleased I saw it twice in one day the second time I saw it I, I enjoyed it even more and, and I, I really um, took it in as much as I could for that second film because I was able to just think about things that were happening because I knew they were going to happen. And uh, I enjoyed it a second time. Brian, for me, this film was was, was fantastic. Well, just out of curiosity, what was your theater like? Because you said you saw it back to back. So like, I mean, and like, how was the like the mood of, of people? Do you have a sense of the buzz that was kind of around in, in your theater? The first showing was a bit quiet, although okay. the, the the second film, um, the, the audience was a little bit more livelier. Uh, hmm. But I think I, I got the same reaction for both films at the end. People, you know, there were some people that clapped. Not everybody clapped. It's not like going to a Marvel film um, no. and getting the reactions. Yeah. But you got some people who who are Batman fans that really enjoyed it, that were really hyped. Even a, a guy that was sitting next to me, hey, who's your favorite Batman? I don't you know? Um, people usually don't do that, but he was, he did it and we, we, you know, we spoke about it. And he's a, hopefully a subscriber now. But again, Brian, this movie delivered on everything that I was expecting to see. Yeah, look, I mean, my overwhelming reaction walking out of the theater was just, yes. <laughs> like that was sort of my like initial, just like emotional state. I. Because the promise and the tease of this movie and the trailers was of something different and a tone that you just don't see a lot when it comes to movies and blockbusters in general, let alone comic book characters that have been relied on to make so much money for studios. Yeah. So I was so happy just to see that this film was allowed to be made in the way that it was. I kept waiting for this thing to kind of almost veer off in a much more formulaic direction. It got a little close in the yeah. very final act. We'll talk about that. But like okay. 90 plus percent of this movie was just this almost like a almost like a knife. It was like narrow, it was focused, it was driving home the same idea in this relentless way. And I loved it. I mean, I, I just thoroughly I ate it up and I enjoyed it. I also had a packed house. It was a very adult house. I was one. I, I was kind of looking around at, before the lights went down. I, I did not I see a, a lot of young kids. I, I didn't see. I saw kids, but not like kids. Kids. I saw like yeah. jun some junior kids, high. Kids. You know. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> we'll check back with them in a few years. Um, <laughs> um, but so it was a very adult crowd. It was. I think I read this later on, but my it was a very male crowd. And I did see that that was a stat. Two thirds of the audience for this movie in the opening weekend was male, um, which is hot. And Marvel definitely gets more of a family, even split across yeah. genders and stuff like that. This has definitely been a male dominated uh, opening weekend. And my theater was very much like that. But it was interesting. My theater was very quiet, but it wasn't really like a detached quiet. Like you could feel tension in the yes. theater. Like everybody was hanging on this movie. Like, yeah. 
nobody was rustling their popcorn. Like nobody yeah. was like, you know, checking their phone. Like everybody was locked in. And that was a cool thing to be a part of. Like people yeah. were focused. And so I was thrilled. Yes. I walked out. I walked out. It was like, I did feel like I had spent some energy. Like I felt like it was a kind of a little bit draining, but I was excited. I did see it again uh, a couple of days later. And it, it left me, and we'll get to this in terms of the future, Anything and everything that they want to do with the Batverse, I'm here for at this point. Because anything that's like been rumored around the table that got any sort of service in this movie left me wanting more of that. Yeah. And I think that's you know some of the best praise I can give to Matt Reeves, who you know, as far as we could tell, is beyond all in on whatever it is they're going to let him do with this. So yeah, I was thrilled. Um, We'll see. I think you did like, may have liked it even a touch more than I did, but I did walk out saying this was one of the most enjoyable, like cinematic experiences I've had in my adult life. I yeah. stand by. Wow. Wow. That's big. That's big. Even with um, Endgame. Uh, Different. Different. Like it's a no different kind home. of enjoyment. Like okay, yeah. See, like it's a different kind of enjoyment. I think, like, like I said, I think in Endgame, you go to those movies for the uplift, for the cheer. For it's the more, it's more, is it is it more exhilarating for those films than than the Batman? The Batman, I think, left me satisfied, very satisfied. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like the bat. That's what I say. The experience of the Batman was like. We'll get into like what Matt Reeves achieved here, but I felt like from the very beginning, like. I was sucked in to his world. And like he was pulling me, he was pulling the strings, and the whole audience was along for the ride. And you felt that, like I said, you felt that camaraderie through tension and through silence. You didn't feel it through cheers or laughs. And I kind of yeah. like that because you don't often get that. And it's so hard to create. I think in some ways it's hard to create that in a movie. Than it is to create the moment that causes everyone to cheer and clap. I think. I mean, I would argue. And yeah. so I felt like this movie was so successful and never let up. It never let you out of that. Yeah. yeah. That I just walked out feeling like, yeah, like this is what going to the movies is supposed to be about, start to finish. Yeah, That's yeah. what I like this one. All right, um, let's get into uh, the technical discussion, some of the aspects of this film yeah. outside of the story and characters. But so direction. Obviously, we feel that Matt Reeves, um, his direction for this film was spot on uh, in terms of tone and in terms of what I think a Batman film, if you're going serious in this way, um, uh, it felt right to me. And it's something that I felt like it needed to happen in order to differentiate yourself from all the others that, that, that we've seen in the past. What were your thoughts on, on the, on the direction that Matt Reeves wanted for, and the tone that the, that Matt Reeves wanted for this film? I loved it. Um, it was funny in the promotion. I mean, Matt Reeves has been, I don't know that that, that dude must not sleep because he's been yeah. everywhere in promoting yeah, this yeah, film yeah. to the fact we're tested positive for COVID and missed the world <laughs> premiere. Um, but uh and he's fine. We, we, yeah, yeah. He's fine with that. But he, he was invoking all of these historical movies. And I don't know that all of those came through, to yeah. be honest, in the film. But one of the reasons I say I was shocked this film was allowed to be made the way it was is that it is shot in a very old school way. The camera is not shaky ever. Yes. It is. Right. It is. And the, and the shots are long and connected there's not a lot of quick cutting there's a little bit of slow-mo but it's not overused it really does and, he, and I listen I've listened to him a lot where he actually says we deliberately chose cameras in many cases that were not the most advanced of their kind because we weren't looking for a cutting edge shot we were looking for a shot that echoed of a past era. And that I think does come through in the film because it does feel like a film that a lot of it could have been conceived of in like the 1970s. Like it feels like there's, a, there's that piece of it. And he's the director. I want to shout out, we'll talk about it a couple of times, Greg Fraser, who's the, the cinematographer, has worked with Matt Reeves a number of times, but now has this movie, Dune, 
zero dark 30 like this guy's a heavyweight uh if you're not familiar with the name he's the kind of guy who like now if you see him on a project you probably know that the camera's in safe hands but i was shocked that the movie really stayed with that like it just it it opened with very slow kind of measured pacing of the shots and it never yes. really deviated even in the chases and the fights yeah. as we remarked in the trailer the camera's just kind of sitting there and you're yeah. watching yeah. the fight play out you're not like taking it from 27 different angles in rapid succession so you know in this era that's unusual and so I, I just ate it up um what did you think of the colors because this was something we heard going in you see it in my background your background is red and black that really mm. was the palette it was a lot of blacks a lot of reds and then kind of grays and neutrals in the middle like what did you think about three hours of really not having a full color palette on display um, they, I think they said it best. I don't know who said it, uh, but in describing, I believe whoever was lighting this, it, it, they, they refer to him as a painter with light and yeah, like that, that showed, um, and that, that stuck with me when they said that about him. So I, I, I loved the direction and, and how this movie looked throughout without it being, to me, in my opinion, uh, boring or anything. There was no room for, <laughs> and we'll get into it a little bit later. <laughs> but um, I like the choices and the inspirations of this film. Long Halloween certainly came out tremendously. And I think we didn't mention it in our last show, but I text you, it, it would be great or is it possible that selena would be falcone's daughter um and right. that came up so there, there was a lot of um uh, aspects of this film that reminded me of what we've already seen before and they just brought it to life i actually thought when i, I when i saw it that both times and i was thinking about like what if someone asked me to describe the visual approach to this film i think in a nutshell i am not the most educated eye on this but it felt like the closest you could ever get to taking actual two-dimensional comic book panels and turning them into three-dimensional film shots. It, so much of this movie felt like when they would focus on Robert Pattinson, who's standing, and we'll talk about this, standing motionless, just capturing, and he's acting literally through his eyes. Mm -hmm. and his mouth and nothing else it looks just like a page in a comic book and you're yes. just waiting wow. for the thought bubble to be written yes. next to it and yeah. and then the next cut would be like you get an out of focus batman cowl he's looking at the bad guys and i'm like i can see the artwork i can yeah. see the artwork right yeah. there put on the screen yeah. and i've never seen anyone try that outside of now, to his credit, Zack Snyder is the only other director I've seen try it. Now, he has only tried it in the context of action. He is, I think, excellent at pulling a visual shot from a comic book, putting it into an action scene and giving you that. But this was an entire movie that was shot where you almost felt like you were flipping pages. That's what it felt like to me. It was like you were flipping pages yeah. in a book. Yeah, and well, like that's the way. I would love to know if that's what they intended to do because that's the feeling I was getting. And I... I, it blew me away because I was like, I just hadn't seen that before in this genre. And to your point about starting something, I have a feeling it's not the last time you might see someone try this now that it's been proven successful and that people have responded to it. So yeah. Matt Reeves and Greg Fraser get the credit for, I think, making that come to life in that way. Brian, we got to talk about the sound, man. The sound. I had to, I, I had to text you. I was like, I, I promised Pablo I wouldn't text him. And then I was like, I got to text him this one thing. Cause I was like, where are you seeing it? Cause I asked you, I was like, are you yeah, seeing yeah. it in IMAX? And you said, yes. And I said, okay. I said, just pay attention to the sound. I was like, That's all yeah. I said. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, it was phenomenal. It, it, yo, how do you do It's almost like, hmm. It's very, it doesn't happen often where you feel as if you're, a, you know, you feel you have that, you, you feel like you're not in the movies per se, but you feel what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, and again, you, you said your, your crowd and my crowd too. Um, 
where there were funny moments, there were people that weren't laughing, but you you heard a few chuckles, but they were funny to me. I was dying in some oh, in some humor. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but people were really focused in this movie and and w- along with the sound uh, of this film you really felt a part of this film and, and hearing what those guys were hearing in the film so um yeah the sound was amazing and it, go ahead i was gonna say it, it was also the absence of sound at points was incredibly powerful there were moments where clearly matt reeves wanted the audience to be so quiet you could hear a pin drop and it was going to coincide with a shot that really had nothing going on it's like the sound of silence literally i thought that i thought that that was so weaponized in this film like the slow track of just when they're in the subway and you hear the footfalls of batman but you can't see him yeah and it's just a little bit it's just like rain a little bit of rain there's no music and you just hear the boots and i'm like that's just so Cool, because everyone is hanging on like, what are we gonna see? What are yeah. we gonna see? And then he kind of walks out very quietly out of the shadows. And there was a lot of that in this movie. And I, I just was like, so I, I did want to shout. I don't have the. I was going through the IMDb. So Lee Gilmore and Craig Hannigan are the sound designers on this movie. Again, you go through the resume: Dune, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, Terminator Dark Fate. There's some, you know, there's some high class, you know, blockbuster stuff on here, but. Yeah. Again, in this genre, we are used to almost like a nonstop stream of dialogue, of score, of explosions, of of just ambient sound. To have sound be so focused and to have silence be so focused in this movie, I think worked really, really well. And that's why I say anyone who goes to see this, go see it at the theater. Go see it in IMAX. Because I do think when you see this on your home TV, you're going to lose some of this because there's going to be stuff going on around you at your house. Whereas like, yeah. if you're in the theater, like you'll be locked in on this. It was awesome. And uh, one final topic in, in terms of technical discussion, um, costume design. Uh, what did you yeah. think about how everyone looked in this film? Wow, I liked it. I liked it. I thought the realism came through really nicely on the costumes. The bat suit played really well on screen, um, yeah. including the up into up to and including. We'll talk about it, but like the wear and tear that it takes, the utility of it. I, I wasn't expecting the batarang to be the actual symbol. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Catwoman's suit looked kind of very utilitarian and very simple. The bad guy suits were very, um, very simple. Like they were kind of classic, like penguins colors and suit are classic. Falcone yeah. looks stylish without looking yeah. like garish. Yeah, um, yeah. Riddler looks, which I mean, like Riddler kind of looks the way if you were trying to take a, you know, a pretty campy green question mark suit and, and, and turn it into a terrifying serial killer, the green fatigues and, and, and the helmet. I, I think it all worked. I mean, this was an interesting mix of people. I kind of went through to see, um so david crossman worked on 1917 that's a big one recently that won an oscar um glenn dillon worked on the most recent star wars trilogy and then jacqueline duran actually is known for more period stuff I, there's nothing action on her resume it's like atonement and a karina like karenina that's like the stuff she's worked on so a real mix of people that put this together but i think for it's one of those things where it's like nothing is gonna be i don't know People always dress up as Batman for Halloween. These aren't the most like Halloween friendly costumes because they're yeah. like not, there's not so many bells and whistles. Exactly. But for the mood that Matt Reeves was trying to create, I thought they all fit really perfectly into the world. So, Brian, what did you think of, of how Gotham was portrayed in this film? Yeah, Gotham is definitely it's a character. I mean, that's why I think from, we put it in the performance category. Gotham is a living, breathing thing in, in this movie. The comparisons you, you're reading and hearing about all throughout the promotion and post have been to sort of the David Fincher backdrop that was used in Seven. That's kind of been the most common comparison. Matt Reeves had said his goal was to have the city not be readily identifiable based on the location in which it was shot. So that's like a comparison to in the Nolan verse. You can kind of see that it's Chicago pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, like if you know yeah. Chicago skyline at all, you recognize it in Batman Begins and Dark Knight. So Reeves said his goal is to have this city be more amorphous, where you couldn't actually tell. It's shot in England, but obviously Gotham is supposed to be like a New York proxy. I think he was pretty successful. There's very little piece of this 
of these sets where you're kind of like, oh, I know that. Like, I know yeah, that's yeah, supposed yeah. to be Madison Square Garden, but that isn't actually Madison yeah. Square Garden. So I think that was pretty well done. I did. I actually was getting echoes to Ridley Scott's Los Angeles from Blade Runner. That was actually what I, maybe it was the rain. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the narration because yeah. there's, you know, Harrison Ford as Rick Decker narrates that movie for you a little yeah. bit. But that was actually more the feel I was getting. This sort, And, I, you know, Ironically, coincidentally, that Los Angeles was 2019, at, even though the movie was made in 1982. So not mm -hmm. far off from the time period that we are now occupying. And I, I dug it. I think it fit, again, this idea of a city. And I have to say, it's a little eerie because this whole thing was written and conceived of in 2017. And to think of how in our real world, how the 2020 and 2021 time frame has really taken a physical toll on yeah. a lot of major cities like what would yes. be a Gotham. There was yes. this eeriness of like, I'm watching this story, which was conceived of very much pre-pandemic and realizing yeah. that like the output is kind of a little bit similar in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I really liked what they did. The dark on dark didn't bother me for what the movie was trying to accomplish. It is a little jarring to have it be like so dark and um, it, it doesn't have the blue shine that like, you know, like a Terminator 2 is largely at night, but it's like blue. It's almost like yeah, glowing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The Matrix, similar idea. A lot of it is at night, but it's like green. Yeah. This is just like dark, dark. I, mean, yeah. I liked it. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. I, you know, for me, and I'll, I'll lead off with this. I think this was the best Gotham that we've gotten um, when I sort of sat down and thought about it, I preferred it to the Nolan verse. It, it actually, for me, was closer with the Burton verse, um, the original Gotham from 1989. But I kind of gave this one a nod. Like I said, it just felt like this Gotham was alive, like its own creature yeah. at times. And I really liked that. I felt like, and again, I was like, because I know we're going to spend more time here with Gotham PD, the Penguin, the sequels to this movie. It made me excited to be like, look, you've created an environment that I am very willing, albeit sometimes a little bit scared, to kind of go back into. So I don't know where, yeah. if, where you stand on, was this the best Gotham? I am in the camp that it was. Yeah. Um, I think the the closest, or the, or the Gotham that comes closest to this is the, the 89 Gotham. Um, um, okay. And for all the reasons that you that you you stated, um, but it will be interesting to see because of how it was left in the, at the end of this film, what it will be in the next iterations. Because all the stuff that he's talked about in terms of what may occur after this is uh, very intriguing, and how what Batman will have to deal with going forward because it's there's a lot of things in this this movie uh brian that I, i'm thinking about when we talk when we get to the section about where does this story go from here quickly um, let me ask you just some of the mm -hmm. some of the landmarks i'm just curious as your feedback like what did you think of like the wayne properties right so we, we the 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 back cave wayne tower we don't see a ton of it um, but also Arkham, you kind of get a shot of Arkham. I'm just kind of curious as to your reaction to how these were kind of introduced and shown on screen. Well, I love the way the Wayne Tower was introduced um, while he was driving in his mo motorcycle and you see the Wayne building, this empire, right? That Bruce mm -hmm. is currently not invested in, um, but I'm pretty sure and hopefully we, when we get to that discussion about the story, this, th that evolves. Um, Arkham, it was cool to hear the name. I didn't get to see much of it. It definitely looks grimy and dirty and, and, and I mm -hmm. not expect that. Um, so I really wasn't too like hyped for it. It was, it was more, um, I guess, um, pleasing to hear uh, the name Arkham and see what Wayne and his headquarters is going to look like going forward. So let's talk about the man himself as Batman. Um, physically he was imposing when he was walking down the, the, the hallway, the corridor where all the cops were and everybody was looking at him. Um, <sighs> the looks that the cops were giving him is if you were there, Brian, 
And this is a serious situation. And you got this guy dressed in the back. It's like, how do you think, you know, people are going to look at him? They were weirded out by him. This freaking fat guy. In the, come on, man. That's weird. And so that really came through. And he was definitely a big guy. It showed that he was a big guy. And, and, and I liked that part of it. Um, what did you think about the Batman, the detective aspect of this uh, iteration? Yeah, I, I loved what Pattinson found and what Matt Reeves you know, wrote uh, and, and what they came up with for this as a starting point. I think that's as critical to evaluating the performance as anything is to understand that this Batman is not the proverbial dark knight. He's not actually the world's greatest detective yet. He's not the full-fledged Cape Crusader. This is more like Michael Jordan in 1988 or <laughs> LeBron in 2006, where the tools are coming together and he can certainly do things that or see things that other people cannot. Yeah. But he's not a finished product. And I think that Pattinson did a great job in this movie of not just kind of conveying what, what his Batman can do. He did a great job of conveying what his Batman cannot do. Yes, I thought the, the monologue to open the movie is so critical because it, ties into the, because it ties into this Gotham Project diary, right? And so it's such a key thing because they established that he says right off the bat, I can't be everywhere. The only, I got to pick my spots, which yeah. kind of tells you like, and then you see you, that he's basically reading to you what he's writing in this journal that's been going on night after night for two years. Yeah. And you understand, aha, he's a student of the game and he's learning. Every yeah. night that he goes out, he's taking notes on what his work as Batman is accomplishing, what it's failing to do. And you see in that montage when the symbol goes up, how he, this is what he understands himself to be at that moment in time, right? The symbol is a source of fear. I pick my spots. They give you the demonstration. He chooses the subway battle. He doesn't show up for the single perp in the convenience yeah. store who then runs away. Like it's a great setup for teaching us where this Batman is located. Like where is he in his arc? Because yeah. this movie then takes you to, in a direction where the Batman is very dynamic. Um, and I love that. Pattinson does change over the course of this movie. And that's when we get to the future discussion is going to be the lifeline, the lifeblood, I think, of this series. But the, phys like the physical acting of not doing a lot yeah. is acting. People need to understand, like when the camera's on you and all he's got to do is basically like, don't twitch. But look this way, like look menacing, look yes. uncomfortable, look yes. excited, but don't actually move. Go yeah. and try to do that. It's not easy. Yeah. And this way, to your point, you brought up a great example, which is like, he doesn't know what to make of the cops any more than they know what to make of him. Now, we will get to, he clearly has this connection with Gordon that is unique, that he does cling to and trust to in these moments. But everything about those scenes is meant to be uncomfortable and he yeah. looks and feels uncomfortable. uncomfortable and it's awesome it's awesome to see because again it's like in real life come on man nobody <laughs> would just take at face value a dude yeah. like this showing up and being like i know everything here's how you solve the case they'd be like what are you talking about and by the way this is occurring on halloween night right the first time we see this that actually is october 31st he tells yeah. us that so you got these guys being like, you're literally in a costume on a Halloween night at a crime scene telling us how to do our <laughs> job. So Pattinson as Batman, you nailed it. I agree with you. If we're separating Pattinson as Batman, number one, I think yes. he's the best Batman we've seen. I think he's the most comics inspired. He's not accurate to everything. They made some changes. Exactly. We'll talk about that. But he's the most comics inspired for a young Batman that we've seen. And I think he captured it. I think he nailed yeah. it. Yeah, that, that monologue um, reminded me so much of year one when I first saw the animated film. Um, and it reminds me also of all the comics that I read. Um, I, listen, I'm not a super nerd on, 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 on 
the comic books. I've, I haven't read them all. I've read the most popular ones, and, and and those are the ones that sort of made me a fan of of the Batman. Um, there's one that I want to catch up on called Batman Ego, which is uh, apparently some, there's some inspiration from there as well that I want to read. Um, but yeah, that opening monologue. Once I saw that, first of all, I, I, I gave myself a pat. You called it. Yeah, you called it. Yeah, yeah, because because it just made sense. Um, and the voice, his delivery of it, um, was just perfect in my opinion. Bruce. Brian, this is where many people have an issue with. I'm not, I'm not so much uh, uh, disappointed in the in the the performance, other than I wish we could have seen that duality. But understanding where his head is at and what he cares about and what he wants to do and what he doesn't want to do, you sort of get where he where he's at with in terms of the Bruce Wayne persona. Um, I don't have Alfred, a problem with it. I don't have a problem you, with it. Really? The point well, of the why movie not? Is to, yeah. So I think, the again, there's a little bit of... T, so a caveat this with, I think this is TBD and we should check where we are at the end of the third film. So I think that's going to be critical. But yes. I think the point of this was to actually establish that there is no duality at this point in his existence. And yes. the Riddler basically hits on that in the final discussion where he's like, there is no matter. You are bad. Like, that's what you are. Like, he's be- basically the same guy in the suit and out of the suit. And in the suit is what defines him, which he clearly says, my family's legacy is what I'm doing. But I actually think that what, what Reeves and Pattinson were going for, and I think the prequel novel actually helps a little bit in this regard, is that Bruce just hasn't spent any time learning how to be a person. He, he basically, as a human being, he's still trapped in whatever happened when his parents were murdered. Yeah. And he spent all this time developing his body, his knowledge, his forensic skills, like all these things that he thinks will be useful to whatever it is he's on the road to becoming as Batman. Mm-hmm. But the prequel novel makes clear like he doesn't spend any time in any one place. He doesn't really build any friendships except with this Dex character who does it. This is not a guy who has social skills. And the point yeah. of the character when he's out of the suit is to reinforce he has no decorum. He has no awareness. He doesn't yeah, yeah. know how to relate to people. I mean, the, when, he's, when he's sitting by Alfred and Alfred basically takes the bomb for him at point blank range and he wakes up in the hospital beaten up and the first thing out of his mouth is you lied to me <laughs> i mean that's that's a dude who has no idea yeah how to connect to another yeah. human being yeah. Yeah. including the one he's been closest to his entire life so i actually think it's okay for where we're starting it won't be okay if he's still doing this in yes. the third film. But I think it's meant to give you this launch pad for growth that the end of the movie touches on. So I actually think it was very purposeful and meant to meant to kind of rub you the wrong way. You're not supposed yeah. to like Bruce Wayne as the person as a person right now because he hasn't learned any tools of like how to be a competent piece of society yet. Yeah. Um those are all valid points. Um, and I think that's where, where, um, hopefully in the second one, he starts to understand that because Alpha let him know, if you keep on this road, you're not going to have anything. And Batman needs his gadgets. He needs money to to support whatever he's doing. So he's going to have to learn. And I think, and not to go too far ahead and now, well, basically what I'll say is when we talk about where we want the story to go, I think that's what we'll have to, or Bruce Wayne, well, the Batman will have to decide what he needs to be in order to stay uh, um, in the know. I think this, but Pattinson and Reeves, what gives me hope is that there are moments in this film that show you that progression in the sense that one of my favorite little touches was actually when he's running from the cops and he's on top of the building and he clearly gets scared. 
for a moment yeah. before he jumps off. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. which tells you it's probably the first time he had to do that, <laughs> right? I got this cool suit, all checks out on paper, but like, man, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm screwed. And like, he has a very human moment of like, am I really going to do this? All yeah, right, yeah, I got to. Yeah, yeah. So Matt Reeves has said he his view of Batman, to take it for what it's worth, he views Batman's true superpower as his will. That's what he believes Batman's essence ultimately, to him, that's what it is. That's not what it is to everyone else. Some people would probably say it would be his acumen as a detective. But for Matt Reeves, he said it's his will. And so you see that come through in this, but what you see is Batman learning. So I just would point out that like at the very end of the movie, he apologizes to Selena Kyle in that last dialogue which is not something I think he would have done at the start of the movie. No. Because he kind of is very unapologetic towards her and unsympathetic towards her when she's talking about losing her friend. Yes. And at the very end, he kind of like, you see a little bit of humanity where he's like, I'm sorry. He says it awkwardly, right? He's like, I'm sorry yeah. for what I said before, right? It's like, it comes out of his mouth funny. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, I like that moment. He obviously comforts the woman on the stretcher at the very yes. end. He kind of, he like looks at her funny and then he puts his hand on her hand. And even how he handles something like the Iceberg Lounge, which I thought was hilarious, by the way. Those two goons at the, the twin goons at the door, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was, that was one of my favorite, like, see, that he kept going back to the door. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my point, in, my point is, at the start of the movie, he basically just tries to beat down the door. He yeah. just knocks on it as Batman, beats the crap out of these two guys, and then gets what he wants. Yeah. And by the end of the movie, he's like, wait a minute, there's a better way than this. Yeah. And so he like gets them to open the door. He tricks them. He appears inside the, and locks them out. And you're like, aha, he's taking notes yes, on yes. how to improve as His, he goes along. And you yes. see it just a little bit as Bruce and a little bit as Batman. And that's what gives me the hope that like all of this is meant to be like, I'm going to ground you in Batman in year two. And that's my Jordan LeBron comparison. But He's gonna he's gonna get a lot better. There are gonna be more time. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna be more Batman. tactful. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um by the way, that part where um he's in the headquarters with the cops and stuff, and he's and you see when he I don't know what what the his um his, bat uh, hook his bat hook. When he lets that fly and he's going up and you see all these cops and stuff, I'm sitting there wondering, no wonder Gotham is messed up. Where the hell are all these cops? Why they're not in the streets? <laughs> there was so many damn <laughs> cops coming after him. So, but that, that was funny. I was, it just left me like, yo, where are all these cops coming from? Um, <laughs> the other performance that I want to get your um uh, thoughts on is the detective aspects now we were supposed to have a guest um unfortunately couldn't make it um but I, i'm hoping to get him on the show soon to talk about this um but he had uh, uh, uh an issue with the detective aspect of his uh performance of of the batman uh, Mr. Ian Dorian, whom I hope to have on the show real, real soon. Unfortunately, going to make it today. But we had a uh, we started talking and, and I didn't want to have the talk, but we got into it and we just went down the rabbit hole. Um, he had an issue with the detective aspect of Batman. You know, his his belief is that the Batman is the greatest detective, yet he wasn't able to figure out the El Rata. And he's uh, also um, he when he used his uh, his utility knife, the, his bat symbol to cut the electricity, you know, and he was going to get electrocuted. But I think we, we sort of get the idea that his armor is sort of built for that because he has some sort of electrocuting device on him that he uses against criminals. So I think that saved him. Um, but, but Brian, and my, my retort to that, and forgive me, Ian, if I, if I misquoted you in the understanding, but it, it, the way I took it as is you expected him to be um, the greatest detective. And like we've been talking about so far is that he's in year two and he's learning. 
He's learning as he goes along, and he's not the perfect Batman that we expect him to be, at least not yet. Um, what did you think about his detective skills? I thought they were brilliant. I thought it was thorough, and he did all the things that he needed to do. And again, it reminded me of the long Halloween, where he was still trying to figure out. He, he wasn't sure sometimes. What were your thoughts? I'm with you on this one. I think I, I know what Ian. Po- I think I think there's a Ian's point is valid in the sense that I think all of us have waited so long to actually see the world's greatest detective that there is a pent up desire of like, why do we have to keep waiting <laughs> any longer? Um, but I think again, when you choose to have effectively 23 or 24 year old Batman uh, as the starting point for your film it would be equally unrealistic to suggest that he would be a finished, that he would have, as we say, we talk about athletes, right? It's like athletes are at their physical peak pretty early in their career, but it's when they have 10 years of experience that the mental game fills in for them. And you get that prime of, I have all the knowledge and I have all the skills and I can combine them and that, and we're not at that for Batman. Mm -hmm. And And so that's why I looked at, I guess my inference from, both reading the prequel novel and the way this movie is set up is that the Riddler case is kind of like the call up to the big leagues. Yeah. It's not like he's been doing 10 serial killer cases with Gordon. My impression was he's been doing more of the subway work. He's been doing the hand to hand, you know, stopping simple crimes. But as we know, he's been studying academically, you know, and in the Batcave, he's been studying kind of the forensics, the chemicals, um, the clues. And so there's a sense of like, he's definitely tagged along with Gordon to crime scenes, but the Riddler case is far more complex than anything he's actually had to work on before. Yeah. That was my like, and I felt like in the first crime scene where it's like, clearly the cops are not used to him being there, right? Yeah. It's not like, yeah. oh, there's Batman again for the 37th <laughs> time. No, like, it's kind of a new thing. Like, why is he at this kind of crime scene, yeah, right? Like, yeah. we know about him, but why is he here? And so yeah. that's why I think it makes perfectly sense to me why you could have a Batman who is incredibly smart, who is incredibly physically capable, but who also is going to be, at times, incredibly reckless and incredibly careless early in his career and make fundamental errors when he's up against someone like the Riddler who is very complex and very clever. So I actually, I think it's okay. Again, this is a TBD. If he's making the same mistakes in the third film, we're probably going to have a little different discussion. But I think for this case, you don't think he'll part of he, this, he'll be better in the second film. No, I'm saying, I'm just saying over the course of three films, yeah, if, yeah, he, yeah. If, I, I if he you, makes, if he is missing missing some of these clues at the outset, the way he missed some of them in this movie, I think we have a problem. But I think for this film, he shows a level of brilliance in solving what he's able to solve. And then he makes mistakes as well that he then presumably would learn to correct if and when he runs up against Freeze or the Joker or or, whoever's coming down, down, down the pike. So again, I'm okay with how they balanced it as long as he is that much sharper in the sequels he still was more much he still was much more of a true kind of csi style detective yeah. than he's ever been on film before and this yeah, was exactly. way beyond that yes yeah. yeah exactly that's why i i listen keaton's detective work i liked that part of keaton's performance because he was a smart dude Again, he was able to figure out Joker's uh, uh, chemistry stuff that he was doing with with uh, makeup and stuff like that. So, uh, and I liked that aspect of him in that film. And in this one, he was coming in and 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 just looking at stuff and telling you what was happening, and was able to solve riddles. And and these guys were like just looking at each other, like what do we do now, sort of, you know. And this right. guy would just come out with the answers. So I, I loved that part of it for him. Um, and I think we'll talk about it more with Gordon's performance, but let's move on to um, Alfred. What did you think of Alfred? Okay, so, uh, hey, so we have, just to wrap it up, 
Sure. Batman, we agree. That's Batman. Bruce Wayne, yes. it sounds like you say no. You prefer Keaton? Is that your favorite Bruce Wayne? Keaton's Bruce Wayne was pretty good. Um, some would say Ben Affleck, but Keaton for me was pretty good. He he was he was still trying to bag chicks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Keaton, <laughs> Keaton was still doing his thing as Bruce Wayne, the Playboy. Um, he he was still uh, he was hosting people. He was he was being Bruce Wayne, um, and that's what I liked about it. Um, I think the best part of that movie is when it says when he's ta- telling Kim Basin singer um, Vicky Vales. Uh, Vicky Vell, he told her, you know, I got to go to work. He told her, yo, enough of this. I got to go to work. And that was it. That, <laughs> that to me was like, this was definitely the best Batman. And now, you know, Patton's is, um, has, has taken it over. But his Bruce Wayne, um, I understand where he's at. I just yeah. wish there would have been some semblance of him understanding what he needs to do. But I understand the choice of not going there. Yeah, I think I think for me the answer is no, but it's incomplete. Like you yes. got to come back to the arc of these films and say, in totality, did he wind up being the best Bruce Wayne? He's not right now. That's not, yeah. I agree with you. He's not, but he's not a finished product. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we didn't get a lot of Alfred in this movie. Yeah, but boo. the little that we did. I was enjoying the dynamic. Brian, I have to say, when he said to him, you're not my father, I think they could have found a better way to sort of say that. It's like, come on, I've seen, I've seen this set over and over again in, 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 in a bunch of different movies and, and shows. The first time I think I heard it when I was a kid, when I was watching Different Strokes, when Todd Bridges' character always used to tell Mr. Drummond, you ain't my father, you know? So I just wish they would have gone about it a different way and wrote something else different to sort of uh, get that same reaction from Alfred. But Alfred nonetheless taking those blows from Bruce Wayne because you know, he must understand that he's not an easy person to deal with but he's there for him, right? Um, What struck me was when he saw the video that Batman had recorded from the, the, the crime scene and he saw the kid, and he, seen, he saw the yeah. same look in Bruce when he was a kid and that like tore him down. And then I guess looking at the, the puzzle or whatever that Riddler left or the, 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 Riddler, the, the riddle and he started messing with it. That showed to me that Alfred is down for him for whatever. And and I love that about him. I just wish we had gone a little bit more, at least possibly towards the end, but we didn't get pretty much anything after the, the hospital scene. But what did you think of Alfred's performance, um, uh, Andy Serkis' performance? Uh, so was it, this is not a knock on Andy Circus. He just didn't have enough to do. This was my yeah. biggest disappointment of the major supporting roles. Uh, I, and I, I would say that I understand that on the one hand, if you're going to make a choice to have relatively few scenes of Bruce Wayne in the movie, which this movie did not have a lot of Bruce Wayne scenes, you're going to have a little bit less of Alfred. But I was disappointed to see that we didn't really see Alfred as... You know, quite honestly, I, I liked this aspect of Alfred in the Snyderverse. I liked Jeremy Irons kind of being almost like his handler when he was in the field. I, yeah, I liked that yeah. aspect of their relationship. And and the only moment in this film where they seemed to be really in sync was the cryptography. That was the one moment where it was like, all right, we're on the same page. We're brainstorming. We're figuring this yeah. out. The, the, I think this relationship is the one that I've circled needs to be the most full fleshed out in the yeah. next film. Yeah. Um, and I think there's groundwork for that because Alfred clearly knows all the family's secrets too, which of which we now know this Wayne family has a lot of secrets, uh, a lot yeah. more than maybe prior Wayne families had. So I just was really, and when I, it's funny, when I saw the, ex, the envelope, which we knew had an explosive device in it, basically, 
I was like, oh no, they're gonna sideline him. I was like, oh no. I was like, I was like, I don't think they're gonna kill him, but oh no, he's gonna take they're gonna take him out of the movie. And then sure enough, they did. And I was like, oh, like no Alfred for the rest of the movie. This is brutal. Yeah. yeah, Um, and so yeah, for me, like a big letdown. So, you know, in case I mean, not even a question at this point, not the best Alfred. Um, I think Michael Caine still for me has the lead in the clubhouse, but just not enough Alfred. Like I need to see more Alfred in, in the next in the next few films. Uh, because I think Circus, the way he portrayed him in the little bit that we saw was interesting. Yes. But just not enough to do. So I was just, this is one of my like critiques of the film is that Alfred was kind of shunted to the side as a character. Yeah. Yeah. I, I liked his Alfred and I, and I wanted to see more of him. Um, but what I got, um, I, I definitely understand the relationship. And I think moving forward, we'll definitely see a much closer, closer uh, tandem um and more trusting one i guess um so I, especially after that talk that they had i think that was probably a moment that they never had before in terms of you know him holding his hand and, and really understanding what his um f- his parents or his father really um was attempting to do after hearing previously some stuff that he didn't know and was really like What is he doing this for, (laughs) you know? And um, that's going to be very interesting to see in the next uh, film. Gordon, Jeffrey Wright's Gordon. What did you think of his performance, Brian? I loved it. Um, I think there's, we talked about the relationships that had to work for this movie to work. As it turned out, I would probably argue to you that this was the relationship that had to work the most because these two guys spent as much time on screen together as I think going in, I would have said like, maybe he's going to spend more time on screen with Zoe Kravitz, but I think he spent, if we measured it, I bet he spent more time on screen with Jeffrey Wright and it, that had to work. And I did, I loved the, so what Wright found in this character that I don't think we had totally seen before was this balance of, his own dogged determination as a detective. He's not a bumbling sidekick. He adds real intel and real information. He doesn't know everything, but he contributes at these yes. crime scenes. He finds things and adds things that even that even Batman is not fully aware of, which I think is really important. And then he shows he not only has the willingness to stand up to other cops to ride for Batman, but he has the willingness to stand up to Bruce in when he's being detained to be like, listen, he, he actually like challenges him. He yeah, knows yeah, he yeah. couldn't stand up to him in a fight. Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah, like, he yeah. challenged him. He's like, almost like an animal. He's like, let me handle this. Settle yeah. down. Like it puts yeah, him on a yeah. leash. Like, let me yeah. handle it. So I love that he had that burst of like, he was very calm and measured. And then he would let loose the sort of fire when he needed to. And of course, you know, to be a good detective, I almost feel like my impression of it, never been a detective, my impression of it is like you almost need a little dark humor because the yeah. job is so dark. And yes. I think he captured that with some of his comments along. He had some funny, funny <laughs> comments, which were like not really kind of gruesome, but like pretty funny. The yeah. only thing I would have asked for is I wish this movie did a great job of avoiding origin story. But I would have liked a little bit of in this particular world what was the linchpin that made these two guys trust each other the way that they clearly do? Funny that you say that. Um, I was thinking of, because the Gotham series is supposed to be a prequel, correct? That's what makes me wonder if we will, we will find this. I think we will find this out. Oh, but. yes. Oh, yes. Um, I think that's why I can't wait. I don't think we're going to get Batman, but we're going to definitely get notes from Batman, perhaps even calls from Batman. Who knows, but there's going to be communication with Gordon in that show that will shed some light as to how they became so trusting of each other. And for him to feel comfortable enough, like you said, it was the first part of this the first time on a crime scene and he brings him in. What transpired between them that he felt like this guy is my partner out in this field. So That's going to be very interesting. But listen. (laughs) What did you think? You were so high on this performance. This was like, actually, you were higher on this performance than on Pattinson going in. So what did you think? To me, Jeffrey Wright is amazing. 
He's fantastic. I think he's one of the best actors out there. Um, and he he never fails to deliver a great performance, in my opinion. His performance as, as, as Gordon, to me, um, I, I just can't wait to see more of that relationship with Bruce and how he handles that position when he's given it, given that position at some point in the near, in, in the next film. Um, but this is acting like when he punches his chest when the cops are in the other room and he says like, listen, and then he's playing the role of like, he's scolding yeah. him, but he's telling him, no, you got to get out of here. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was, I thought that, I thought that was just well, well done, man. And, and there's just so many, there's just, an, uh, when he talks to the penguin, and when he's going, when him and Batman are going with the penguin and talking to him, it's just, it's just great. That performance is just great. And what I found the most funny part when he, when he saw you, you could have pulled that punch. <laughs> when, like, I did. When he, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, Jeffrey Wright was hitting, they were playing each other, playing off each other uh, uh, well. And, and I'm pretty sure, like you said, I think in a previous um, show, Gordon is a fan of the Batman, you know, and I'm pretty sure he's amazed when Batman figures out, figures out a clue. Like when he figured out that, that thumb drive, when yeah. and he's in the car and what are you looking for? A, a USB port. He opens up a compartment. He looks and he looks at Gordon and he's like, what? Thumb, thumb and, drive. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Although he's disgusted, but he's impressed. Yeah. That's why it's, 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 I guess it's a high when you're working with someone that's intelligent. Like, I mean, Watson Holmes, they can't um, ignore the brilliance in other individuals. And that's why they want to work with. But that's what I mean. Like, I think like he's bet he's, he's more essential than Watson is to Holmes. Like, I think Watson is like, not to go off on a tangent, but the way Conan Doyle writes the stories, Holmes is really the only one with the powers of observation. Yeah. And Watson's utility is kind of like, almost like he's the muscle, right? Like he's the guy who was in the armed forces. And so if you need a good gun, like when Holmes points in the direction, he shoots. Yeah. Right. This Gordon is better than that. When they're trying to figure out who the rat is, Gordon is the one who provides the intel and the background that Batman's not privy to, basically, and says, look, here's what happened in the Moroni case. Like, here's what we know. Like, he's kind of laying out the field and the pieces and thinking it through. He doesn't have Batman's keen eye to the same degree, but he's definitely earmarked as he is not your average beat cop. Like he's a yeah. he as he's a really good cop. Like he's like yeah. a high level high level cop. So I like that they gave him that that sense of yeah yeah he's not on Batman's level, but he's also not like a free rider. Like he deserves to be in that relationship as a contributor, and that's probably at least part of what Batman sees is that this guy, in addition to not being corrupt, is yeah. actually he's like legitimately good, good, good. good yeah. at what yeah. he does. Um, so I actually really, but like I said, it's the one thing that like the trust is so ironclad. Like there are moments in this movie where you're like, boy, if he really doesn't trust Batman, Batman's gone pretty far across the lines here to where like, that's where I need to have a little bit of that filled in for me for this universe. I know it generically what it is, but like, I need to have them fill in what events, what case, what moment gave these two guys that a singular like we trust each other we got each yeah. other's back no matter what uh, i want to see that what did you think i mean the, the way i saw it was batman was possibly going to get out and he wanted to say one last thing to him before the truth was out when he said to him when he was going to go visit the riddler at arkham he told gordon you're a good cop why do you think he told him that? Uh, yeah, I think he had a sense of finality. He had probably like a sense of like, I'm not, he was kind of doubting if he was going to get through this one okay. Or, or as you 
said without uh, without his identity being. There was a sense of like almost defeatism. I'm not sure I'm going to pull this off. So in case I don't, I just want you to know, like you know, I you know, I, I hats off to you, kind of deal. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of where 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 that was where that was going. Uh, okay. I am curious to see, obviously, like. You almost don't want Gordon to be promoted. Like these guys are so good in the field together. You'd almost rather see them stay in the field. But I kind of feel like for this series to grow, we know that this Gordon has to ascend through the department and that's going to change their relationship. I think it's going to change their relationship. It might even strain it at times. So, Yeah, and that will be interesting to watch. But understandably so, Batman is going to be more... Gordon is going to... They're going to need each other. And Gordon being in that position, he's the guy that's going to know it, pretty much everything. And um, for Batman, that is a, 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 a resource that's invaluable to him. Um, right, so best, best Gordon, yes sir. Best Gordon, yes or no? It's a two horse race, I think. But which yeah, one it's, only, it's only it's uh, only uh, what's the gold? Is it what's his last name? Well, Gary Oldman and then Oldman, 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 is, Oldman and, 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 and Pat Hingle from back in the day. But yeah, so no, 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 no. Is Oldman and oh, and then J.K. Simmons. Sorry, J.K. Simmons, nah, technically. No, nah, no. Nah. J.K. Simmons just stands there, turns a the light on. That's what I said. It's a two horse race. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's a two horse race. Um, yeah. Those two are, listen, before we move on, I think the single greatest moment for me in terms of, of Batman and Commissioner Gordon or Gordon was when Batman first introduced himself in Batman Begins. I loved that dialogue, especially the last two things that he said to him. Um, I think when Oldman said to him, uh, you just one man. And Batman says, now we're two. And he's that's out. Good line. That's to, that's that's. Those are Batman moments. And, and again, at the end of it, you know, I never said thank you. And you never have to. Those, are, those, to me, those moments are, for me, are, are like the best moments. And those, I, 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 that's why I, I highly regard those films that Nolan put out um, because of how he understood the relationship between those two and how much they trust each other. And, and that was, for me, that was great. So I don't think we've gotten that moment between them two, the two right just yet um but i like where it's going so far yeah i'm with you i think i think it's an, almost an unfair question because olman has three films and gordon ha and, and uh, jeffrey wright has one but i'd say yeah i think i think gary olman has a, has a, has a lead but i think jeffrey wright is out of the gates faster than gary yeah. olman was in batman begins i think this yeah. is a better this is the best start to a gordon that i've I've ever seen. The one thing I will say that I like that Nolan did a couple of times, and I want to see where this one goes, is Nolan expressed the trust between Batman and Jim and Jim Gordon the other way, which is if you remember, like in Dark Knight, when they get when they realize the Joker has planted the two explosives and he's taken both Harvey Dent and Rachel Dawes hostage, Batman with no hesitation basically is willing to say, like, hey, I'm going after Rachel. I trust that you're going after the other. He he is fine delegating. And you see that again in The Dark Knight Rises. Batman is fine trusting Gordon to do pretty much anything he asks him to do. Yeah. We didn't necessarily see that same degree of delegation here. right? We yeah. saw Gordon trusted Batman to help him. In the final set piece, we didn't really see Batman kind of telling Gordon, hey, you take care of the mayor, I'll take care. Like There wasn't that sense of divide and conquer yet yeah, that I yeah. think Nolan kind of used to express that these two guys leaned on each other. So I'll be interested to see where we get to with, with this pairing, but we're not there yet. So that's one aspect that I think you know Gary Oldman kind of has in his in his quiver right now that, yeah, that yeah, Jeffrey yeah. Wright does. But, but I think it's, like I said, it's the best start to a Gordon yes. that we've had in these movies. Yes. Catwoman, Zoe Kravitz, Brian. She was, she was, listen, when she was casted, I thought she was perfection for this role. Mm -hmm. And she proved to be so. Um, physically, skill wise, um, her personality, her, the chemistry they had, 
it was just for me classic relationship um it, it almost reminds me of batman the animated series um the relationship mm-hmm. they had there um what were your thoughts on zoe kravitz performance as catwoman yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, Zoe Kravitz is, in general as an act, she leaps off the screen or whatever yeah. she's in. I think it's it was kind of funny. I, one of my humorous notes was I felt like Batman was channeling all of us when she first <laughs> appears in the club, and he he's trying to focus on Penguin, and you could see his eyes. Like, I can't stop looking at, at Zoe Kravitz <laughs> over there, and I was yeah. like, yeah, that's pretty much how it would be for all of us, I think. But you know, whether yeah. it's her runway walk or um, you know her work in the suit, and you're right, I mean. I don't know how many how they screen tested these two, but they clearly there's some real heat, you know, between the two of them when they're on the screen, especially considering he's in the costume. I mean, she's yeah. never really interacted with him when he's not in the costume. So they look physically. It's interesting. I we didn't get like the true side by side fight. They were in an action scene together, but you didn't really see like the two of them as a tandem fighting. Um, but they seem pretty physically well matched. So, no, I mean, I think the other thing people probably, if you're not familiar with the comics, and you alluded to this, this was the most comics-inspired Catwoman in the sense of they took the birth ties straight out of one of the comic storylines. They they gave her true cat burglar skills that, you know, Anne Hathaway had done a little bit of that, but, like, yeah. we really saw, like, she's got a kit, like, she's got gadgets like she's out there yeah um but generally doing it to help her friends like that it wasn't the sense of like she's just robbing people for the sake of robbing people like there's real purpose to that but then you get the mixed morals and the motivation she's very happy to use a gun you know whereas batman's like no don't don't do that like you know so i thought that she captured a lot of what the comics would tell you catwoman and selena kyle has come to be uh, in, in the Bruce Wayne universe, so I was I was thrilled with the performance that we got. And again, I don't know if we get. I know there's. I think there's been some rumors that she might get something out of this. Like you know, maybe she gets a show, like the Penguin show or something. There might be something coming her way, but I don't know. I just I felt like, look, this is this is definitely somebody that can, you know, carry a a, a leading role in this franchise for as long as they want to do it. And the chemistry with her and Pattinson's great. So no, I. Yeah, full marks for this. And like I said, it's definitely the most comics inspired and driven sort of version of this character that we've seen. I've contemplated the the thought of perhaps having um, uh, a show for her or a movie. Um, I just, I'm not that excited for it. I just think they play so well off each other. Yeah, you might uh, need Batman for that. That's true. So, so it, it's... Uh, I don't know if we we get that, um, but nonetheless, you know, you talk about the way Batman was in the club looking at her. I'm talking about the way he was looking at through the binoculars. <laughs> what? what that? Okay, so I know so that's that, creepy, but <laughs> no, it was. But that whole that, so that whole scene, which is unintentional comedy, is the weirdest analogy. But I I can't wait for you. Remember, like in Back to the Future. When Michael mm-hmm. J. Fox sees his dad up in the tree, he's yeah. like, he's a peeping Tom. Like, that's what he kind of had this sense of, like, what the, what he was doing. I was yeah. like, come on, man. Like, what? Like you know. But again, I think it goes to, like, this Bruce Wayne doesn't really have any, like, social cues. So he doesn't yeah, think yeah, twice yeah. about, like, invading someone's privacy like exactly. that. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and who knows? Perhaps... Um... She reminded him of, of Dex. Who knows? Um, yeah, he... I, w- I really wanted to know. It was totally yeah. like left on the table. But having read the novel, I was like, I don't know. It felt like there was something. I don't know. It felt like there was something there. But yeah, yeah. I think he was mostly looking at her because she reacted to things. And initially, when he saw her, he looked at her. She like he, you know, he looked at her like, "Who's this?" You know. Um, but he, yeah. he gained more interest in her when she reacted to the picture and her sort of s- continuing to still look through. That's why Batman so perceptive. He even saw her through the broken glass behind the penguin. So that yeah. was like, so he, he knew something was up. But again, I think Zoe Kravitz's performance was fantastic. And um, I, I can't wait to see more of her in the other films. I don't know how she'll be um, placed in these films. Um, 
but it'll be interesting because this again, Brian, this is supposed to be a trilogy. So it'll be interesting where she's placed, whether she's in the Penguin series, where whether she's in some other series that they, they choose to do in the future, because obviously Bat- Matt Reeves is building a Batverse. What is that going to entail in these three movies? There's a lot of ground to cover if he's going to be putting some of these other characters that he's thinking about doing, like Quarter Owls, Mr. Freeze, and possibly even Bane, and I'll tell you why later. All right, so best best Catwoman, you want her or Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, or Anne? I mean, or Anne Hathaway. I guess I'll put it out there, but I'm not gonna. No, sorry, Halle Berry, you're not making the conversation. No, no, it wasn't <laughs> even in the running. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even. It wasn't even in the running. Earth, I guess. Uh, I, I guess Eartha Kit. Eartha Kit would technically be the other uh, the other version of this way back when. But yeah, so. yeah um, I don't remember too much of her performance. But I know a lot of people, a lot of actresses who, who, who've who played the character of Eartha Kennedy, especially people of color like Halle Berry. And perhaps, I, I don't know if Zoe Kravis mentioned it, but um, I'm pretty sh- sure they took inspiration from her. Um, but, um, and I'm interested in hearing Ian's um, um, uh, thought about it. I'll ask him because we're supposed to do another show. Um, again, unfortunately, he can't, couldn't make it today. He had other things that he had to tend to, and that's fine. And um, But he had mentioned in, in his text that um, I think Michelle Pfeiffer is his favorite. I got to yeah. get a little bit of uh, uh, insight into why that is. Um, I don't remember. I, I, I wasn't a fan of Batman Returns. Interesting. Um, yeah, the penguin it's, you know, stuff. It's a flaw. It's a flawed movie. Yeah, I, I gave it to Pfeiffer. I still think she. It's a totally oh, different okay. take in a totally different universe. I, I. It's close. I think like Kravitz mm. is. As I said, I think she's the most comics accurate. Yeah, but I think Pfeiffer. I think you know. Granted, I was thirteen when that movie came out. Like I think for people, for people that for like boys that age, like <laughs> what she represented was like something pretty cool. So yeah, yeah, I just I don't know, but like she she was like her own universe in that film. Like she had her own language. She was so over the top. Like she'd be like she would like eat like rodents or whatever. It was so wild. Like what they did yeah. with that. But the costume and the the sensuality that she played off of Michael Keaton. Uh, I, I just, it, it's, it's to me, it's the thing you remember the most about that movie. Like she is what you take from that movie. You don't take Batman. You don't take yeah. the Penguin. Yeah. Um, it is that it is Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. So she's still probably the leader, my leader in the clubhouse, albeit like, it's kind of like apples and oranges, but I think like, like I said, this is another example of like for the vision that Matt Reeves had, this is the perfect Catwoman for that universe, right? Like that Michelle Pfeiffer performance doesn't belong in this world any more than Zoe Kravitz belongs in the Burton world. So yeah. for, for this world, Zoe Kravitz, I think full marks. Uh, I'm really excited to see where we go from here. Paul Dano's performance as the Riddler. Listen, the way Matt Reeves did this character for this world that he's building was perfect. Every riddle that he laid out and, and all the stuff that he had to, that he made Batman do was done so cleverly, right? It wasn't corny. Like the thumb drive, that thing was hilarious, Brian. That was like, that was, that was like, wow. <laughs> that, it was just, when you're blown away by little stuff like that, that's 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 good stuff right there and um paul dano's performance reminded me similar similarly when you i don't know if you ever saw um there will be blood but it was yeah. there was that type of uh, a performance yeah. over the top and and yelling and, and and sort of singing his 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 uh thoughts sort of in a screaming and me- melodic uh tone uh but the way this Riddler was was unique from any other Riddler we've ever seen before, literally, right? Um, 
Jim Carrey's was Jim Carrey. Um, <laughs> to me, this was the, my favorite um, um, portrayal of the Riddler. Um, and uh, just the way I, we were hoping, Brian, and we, we spoke about it last time, if Riddler would get away. Um, he didn't get away. He did what he, he wanted to accomplish. Um, and I think we'll still see more of him. I think there's more to this um, um, character in future iterations. What were your thoughts on on on, on Paul Dano's uh, portrayal of the Riddler? And this yeah, I, I mean, I think he, he, yeah, he. I mean, he he's the best. I mean, if so, if you say it's him, it's Jim Carrey, and then Frank Gorshin was the Riddler in the Adam West uh, of Batman yeah. movie. He, this is the best version of the Riddler. I don't think it's the best Batman villain. I don't think he approaches Heath Ledger's. No. Effort as the Joker, which I still think is that's hands down the best Batman villain on live action that we've seen by far. Yeah. Yeah. But I think his purpose as a character was to make things disturbing and to make things uncomfortable. And I think he was very successful in that. I, I really like the opening attack. It's funny because you're seeing the open. And it's funny when we started the movie, it's almost like a almost like a cold open. They just show you like the Batman and then you're in it. You're in this scene. And it, it, part of the time you're like, am I seeing this through Batman's lens or am I yeah. seeing this through the Riddler's yeah. lens? Which is exactly what you're supposed to think, right? That duality of like the, the hero and the villain aren't that far apart. But when he drops into the mayor's house and he just stands there, he just yeah. stands there. Like he's, he, did, I mean, he was been there for like a couple minutes, lets him yeah. finish the phone call. I was like, this is pretty creepy, right? It's like Michael Myers type stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end, when he has finally his one scene, really shared scene with Pattinson, he, he really captures sort of this, you know, the disturbed nature, the twisted motivations um, and this unhinged, you know, oh, this wasn't the way this conversation was supposed to be. Oh, like he does a really good job of like unsettling you which like you're yeah, not yeah. supposed like in a way that like ledger you still had this mo you still had this feeling of i'm being thoroughly entertained by what yeah. i'm seeing as sadistic as it may be this was much more meant to be like it's meant to make your stomach churn and make yeah, yeah, your yeah. skin crawl and so he, he does an effective job at that and yeah i i absolutely stand and applaud the fact that he's an arkham and he's not dead and that yeah. we'll get to it you know, and, and talking about where we go, but like he didn't, he didn't fully win. He clearly was disappointed. He could see on the monitor at the end, he was upset at what Batman was able to foil, mm -hmm. but he didn't really lose either. Like he, yeah. he definitely won a piece of it. He flooded the city. Like they didn't yeah. prevent, they yeah. didn't prevent the detonations from going off. Like, yeah. Um, so I think that was a career. He just choice by Reeves to basically say, look, he's if he lost the battle with if he lost and if we were keeping score, this was kind of like Batman won this one like four to two. Like he didn't really yeah. win it 99 to nothing, you know, like and so <laughs> yeah. that's unusual for a film like this. Like there was cost. There was and so and the Riddler, as we know, he's in Arkham, and he someday is going to be at large again. We'll see if yeah. it's right in the next film or not, but I love that he's in this universe and can come back in a future time. So, absolutely the best Riddler, nowhere near the best Batman villain, but I think, again, Dano executed the mission for what this character was supposed to be exactly the way you would want it to be. And, and really the only way I think you could take the comics Riddler and modernize it. This to me, that's why this whole discussion about like grounded villains, I felt like the Riddler is one of the silliest ones they had, and they managed to make it yeah. pretty frightening. So I think job job well done there. Yeah. Um let's 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 save the best for last. We're gonna yeah, go on right, to okay. we'll go uh, um, Falcon. let's do Falcon. Falcon. So what did you think? We, we we hadn't seen anything in the trailers too much. I mean, towards the end, they, was, they started to show little bits and pieces there. Um, what did you think of, about Falcone's, uh, John Totoro's character? Uh, he was a sadistic Joey Kanish from Rounders, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I never, about I've never seen it, about, but it, I, Oh, you got to see it. Yeah. So I, he basically was like talking about David and Rounders. This was the same like 
affect, but with a little more sadism. It wasn't my favorite performance of the supporting characters to be. I mean, John Turturro's never bad. This wasn't my favorite performance. I thought it fit okay with the environment. I did like the talk with Bruce at the club where he's almost talking to him like he's his son. Like that was really sort of uncomfortable and I thought it was played pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's clear he was more there to kind of further this movie's plot and take us to where we really needed to go than really be his own great villain. So I, it just was one of those words like, Totoro was probably overqualified for this role. I'm a little impressed that they got him to do this, especially considering, spoiler alert, he doesn't make it out of the movie. Um, so this one to me like, is definitely below, like we've been talking about performances. Uh, th this one was probably closest to like Alfred in the sense of like, it was okay, but like we didn't yeah. see a ton of it. And... I don't know that this was the best written of the supporting parts that we had. He, had, but like I said, he did have like a couple highlights, but not my favorite. Yeah, I did, yeah. I did like him better than Tom Wilkinson, the Tom Wilkinson version in Batman Begins. I liked his style and the way he was played better, but mm -hmm. overall, I kind of give like a average to kind of you know middle of the road mark for for this one. Yeah, I agree. I thought I. I... It didn't really stand out to me that performance, even though John Turturro was was great as Falcone, but he wasn't like the standout of all the characters that we that we discussed thus far. Um, and uh, I think a, 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 it would have been better for another person to take that role and, and not him. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, I think he did a fair decent job but nothing like like oh my god his performance was great i think he did a, a yeah. okay job you know it wasn't uh i don't think anybody that they put in that role would have been bad um with matt reach behind the camera directing you know what I'm saying? anybody really could have done this role but in terms of i guess for me visually the, perhaps another uh another actor would have uh stood out more in this mm. role now, <laughs> this guy, Brian, I couldn't wait for his scenes to come up. Watching it the first time and watching it the second time. Every time this guy was on screen, I was like, I want to see what he's going to say, <laughs> what he's going to do, you know? Um, Colin Farrell was a penguin. Brian, I think it's safe to say he was the MVP of this 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 movie. Oh, the whole movie. Oh, I interesting. Think so. I think so. Batman, oh, Batman okay. was there too, but for the penguin, he was that performed when when Batman and Gordon have him cornered, they, they caught him. This is after the chase, which is great, by the way. It was a dope chase. Yeah, we'll talk um, about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. But when they got and they're interrogating him and everything this guy says, yo, I was dying when he said, you, you guys should start harmonizing. <laughs> yo, he had me dying. And the expression on his face when these guys are telling him what's happening, they're like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. And then him um, Explaining to them, explaining to them El Rata and the Spanish, you know, this he was yo, know, Colin Farrell killed that performance. <laughs> Brian, what did you think of the penguin, man? Yeah, no, this is of the of the supporting roles, this was this was the ape. So I, I can't give him the MVP just because he wasn't in the movie enough. Yeah, true. Okay, okay. But he was definitely the sixth man of the year. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I mean, he, he he came off the bench, you know, and I, my image of Colin Farrell was like, did he just, did, did he show up to set? He does like his couple hours of prosthetics and he like, he takes a napkin and he gets his tools and he says, bring me a 64 ounce steak and I'm going to just chew on it every time I get on screen. Cause that's what he did. Like yeah. he, this was a true transformation 
if you didn't know it was Colin Farrell, you would not recognize Colin Farrell at any point in this performance. That's really the best thing I could say. Like, this is a yeah. guy, he's, this is, you know, a handsome Hollywood man with an Irish accent to die for. And he buries all of it inside this <laughs> gimpy, grotesque, you know, but as you say, pretty smart, like pretty savvy and pretty funny, you know, yeah. bad guy who I am really hoping is now being set up kind of not as like a future arch nemesis of Batman, but more like the guy who plays both sides and is behind everything and weasels his way through everything, like never gets really caught. Like he, he's got his hands and all this bad stuff, of course. But, but when Batman needs him, might actually turn to him, you know, and be like, well, you're the lesser of evil. I think that's what this is being set up as. And gosh, I mean, you could not have a better advertisement for your own HBO Max show than what he delivered in this. You walk out of this movie, you're like, you can give me all those episodes tomorrow and I will binge watch them. Yes, yes. And listen, Colin Farrell deserves an award, best supporting actor for this role, because to me, he was just amazing in this role. Listen, if, if Mahershala Ali can get an Oscar for five minutes, <laughs> this guy can get an Oscar for the amount of time that he was on screen. And he was there and delivered each time. Colin Farrell's The Penguin was, was, was a great, great performance and, and a great, great interpretation of The Penguin. And I love Matt Reeves for, for doing it this way, man. Uh, he, was just, he was just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's also another example of, again, Oswald Cobblepot can go really silly. You know, that can go really silly and really wrong. And so they found this lane to modernize, keep the name, modernize the character, and make him be believable, threatening, and fun all at the same time in this universe. And again, is he the best bat? No, I mean, I'm not going to put him alongside Heath Ledger. He's only in like five scenes of this movie. Yeah, yeah, but but like I said, they they have found. I mean, what what a brilliant stroke of cat! It is comparable to Ledger in the sense that if you told me Colin Farrell was going to play the Penguin, which is what we were told way back when, I would have said you're crazy. Like how? Like what 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 about him says Penguin? And then you see it on screen, and you're like, you know, it's funny. Like Hollywood's been trying to make Colin Farrell a leading man for twenty years, mm-hmm. and there's a part of me that's like this might be his true calling more as like the character actor who, who is, who is like second or third bill. Cause he seems to just do better when he's not the number one guy being Colin Farrell. Horrible bosses. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I hate to say this. I mean, you know, I, I don't want, I hate to say this because we're talking about a great comic book movie. But as as horrible as the original Daredevil movie was, he's the only dude in that movie having fun. Like yeah. he's the only dude who walked when you when you leave the theater, you're like, I don't know what the heck that was that he was doing as Bullseye, but I couldn't take my eyes off he it was when memorable. he was on screen. He, it was he's, just, the, he's the most memorable, memorable part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's the most so memorable like, part I of that. I just though. feel like when he gets handed these roles, he shines. So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the show. I cannot. Because we also heard, I think the show is supposed to come after. It. So the Gotham PD show might be like before this movie, but this the Penguin exactly, show yeah. is this coming is after. And the yes. way this movie leaves him, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, he's, yeah. he's now ascended in the mob. Like, give me what he's going to do next. Yeah. I would put him in the same camp as Johnny Depp in terms of when he transformed into a different uh, character, when he's not- Versus when he plays himself. Exactly. He's, yeah, he's that, he's that, he's that, he's that. Um, Brian, what do you think in 2023 of its Oscar potential? Do you think, what, do you, what, what sort of awards would you put it up for? Um. Well, you've given away one that you want to give. Uh, I think yeah, I'm going to say, like <laughs> I did, well, that's an, that would be an inspired choice. I, I, if they did it, I would certainly applaud. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think Best Picture is on the table. 
I think there's enough criticisms and, and flaws that we can point to that that I just don't think it gets there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to say like Matt Reeves, but that is not getting there. It's not he's not going to be nominated. And I, I honestly don't think so. I honestly don't think any of the acting performances are going to get nominated. Um, but, 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 but what's interesting to me when I sit back and think about that is it's not an indictment of the performances. Everything about this movie really kind of worked. And I think about it as this was the consummate team. Um, this was, everyone was committed. Everyone got the vision and everyone wrote, there was nobody where you're like, what movie are they in? Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see movies where like, there's somebody who's like, they're just doing something weird. And like, that doesn't fit with what the <laughs> other cast is doing. Everyone here was playing their role, but I think of it more of as like a team where you have a lot of above average to like all-star level players versus you don't, you aren't getting carried by one or two hall of famers. And yeah. unfortunately when it comes to Academy Awards, it's the hall of fame performances that get the recognition and get nominated. And I don't know that this film had those, but as a collective, so I'm going to take a little deke here. The SAG awards give a nomination for best ensemble, ensemble. in a drama. Okay. I think, I think there's a case to be made that this yeah. cast deserves to be nominated for that as a collective, even if not one of them gets a nod uh, for an Academy Award nomination. I do think on the technical side, I had three that I really hope we see. Um, cinematography, I really think Greg Fraser should get a nomination. Sound design and editing, I think it should win. I don't even yeah. know what we're doing here if this, yeah. if this movie is not in the... I don't know what you're listening to if this movie doesn't win, but anyway, yeah. I don't totally understand it. I think also the Giacchino score should be nominated. I think the score fits perfectly with this movie, and we haven't talked yeah. about the music, but it really adds something when he's pounding that theme. Um, there's the Nirvana cover as well, which I kind of wish they hadn't used in the trailer now because it was so cool in the movie. I'm like, man, yeah. I kind of wish I didn't know it was there. Yeah. And um, But then the lighter touch. Uh, some of the stuff at the funeral and like some of those themes of Bruce Wayne and Catwoman. I, I loved it. I love what the music did. So I have cinematography, sound design and score as the three nominations that I think it has a legitimate chance to get. Unfortunately, I just don't think the Academy is going to nod any of the, the big headline yeah, yeah, category. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. you want Penguin, so ride for Penguin. Yeah, uh, yeah let's go for Penguin. Um, was there a scene the music felt James Bondish, a little bit, a little bit, and and that was the scene that 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 it took me there was um uh, when it was them two Catwoman and and, and uh, uh, the Batman, and they were I guess they were, I guess their first kiss and there was this sort of music I think it was a Catwoman's uh um music her theme song yeah I, I think you're right it was, my, yeah. it was a version of the theme yes 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 that 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 music sort of felt Jane Bonds is to me but yeah the music was was dope it was right on it was perfect with the film um but yeah let's move on to the so do you, um, well, do you have any others you want you so you're in for four you're in for Farrell plus the three that I named is that yeah, kind of yeah, where you're yeah, at? yeah 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 okay you don't yeah. think like Reeves or the picture will, will, you don't think it gets nominated for best. Yeah. Okay. It, I wouldn't be surprised if it did get best nomination for best director. Cause he did a hell of a job with these characters. Really? He did. I, mean, I agree with it, but yeah, I don't know, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't think he'll win, but I wouldn't be surprised if he nominated. I'll be surprised as hell if he won, but not surprised yeah. if he got nominated. Um, let's get to some of the stuff that, you know, may make some other people out there who, especially who loved it, like, this is the best thing on earth. Our biggest criticisms and disappointments. Brian, I have to admit, after watching it the first time, I was sitting there, I was like, yo, this is, this is, we, we need to wrap this up, right? I didn't feel that way the second time, but the first That's time I was... Uh, the first the first time I definitely felt like this this movie is a little bit too long. And after watching the movie a, a second time, there's some scenes you could have definitely brought this movie down to like yes. 250 to 45. There were some scenes there that went on too long. I understand, and we and you and you touched on it earlier. Um, he he left you hanging 
and and sticking to a particular shot, which I'm, in, you know, to get some sort of effect, especially when it came to the Batman. But there were certain points where, like, at the end, the ride when they're riding together, like. And then they say their goodbyes. I'm like, yo, we said goodbye. We don't need to see them riding off in in some. We don't need to see that. You could have done away with that. Um, for me, these if you're gonna do three hours, there was a scene that was cut out that I think you could have replaced it with the scene with the Joker, where Batman goes into argument and sort of talks to the Joker to sort of find out what he's dealing with here. I think you possibly could have kept that thing. That would have been a dope uh, a scene. Um, uh, there was a scene where when Batman was landing on the bus from his flight, that transition from him being messed up when he landed to him yeah, being chilling really. up on the roof, uh, um, chilling on the roof already. He's cool already after hobbling down, you know, looking like um, after, <laughs> I, I don't want to touch on it, the kingpin when he got crushed by that car and he's hobbling away. There's no normalcy to that immediately, right? So you could have spent that time back with uh, uh, Alfred healing you and doing something to take care of whatever, but don't go back immediately and he's chilling no he he landed hard so that was kind of weird for me you could have replaced that so there's some decisions that were made that i don't didn't i didn't quite agree with um, um were there any other criticisms i had of the film i can't think of them now but i don't know the some of them you may have that i may agree with what were your uh, biggest disappointments and criticisms of the film Sure. Well, I'll build on some of the ones you 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 have because I have some of the same ones. So yeah, the film is too long. Um, I it ends over and over again. I, I actually like. So on the one hand, I, I do understand that Matt Reeves was em emphatic about, hey, a trilogy is not promised to me. I, I I have an idea for it, but I have no promise of a sequel. And that's why I think the movie tries to basically wrap. It has ending scenes to wrap up all of these threads. But it mm -hmm. takes too long. It's about like 10, 12 minutes of, of scenes. And that alone could have gotten you from, I think the movie is 256, but it's 248 of actual film. Right there, you're probably down from 248 to 238, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you, mm -hmm. you could have picked different spots um, to end this film. You could have even done it, honestly. I, I thought about the bold. If you really wanted to go all in bold on ending this film, which I understand why they didn't, but... You could have ended this film after the conversation with the Riddler and Arkham, where Batman discovers underneath the rug. And if you cliffhang the movie there with like realizing that Gotham was rigged to blow, but you didn't show exactly, that would have been a really like ballsy choice to end the yeah. movie, but you yeah. could have done it. So that, yeah. but like I think to your point, the Catwoman ending, even the Catwoman ending scene ends like three times, right? There's the, <laughs> ending in person there's the ending where they turn off in different <laughs> yeah, directions and then that. there's the actual ending. so like yeah. you just don't need all that i definitely think there's there's a two and a half hour cut in here that is 99 percent as effective as what we got and would have solved people's complaints about the length so i'm going to disagree with you on the joker scene i don't like that the joker was in this movie i wish he was not uh, we can yeah. talk about that in the future, but I think that wasted wasted a couple of minutes of screen time. And yeah. I think there was other ways to bring him into this universe with what you're building that that scene more than any other felt like a little bit of a shoehorn, felt like a little bit of a studio being like, hey, can you throw like an Easter <laughs> egg in here? I didn't like it. And I think it yeah, took yeah. up some time. So I would have taken all references to the Joker out and put them somewhere else in in the universe so those are kind of the main cuts that i had it was the ending and, and and the joker and i think that alone like i said i think you could have had a two and a half hour film right there um i mentioned alfred slacker role uh that was definitely one of my my main critiques of the film my other one was sort of on the set pieces so and i have to preface this with the good and the bad the car chase is awesome it's amazing i loved the car chase i, know, I, I, I love how I they shot it you, I, I think i know where you're going with this go ahead 
So I love how they shot it. And it's amazing because I was literally sitting in the movie and I was like, wow, this actually reminds me of the French connection. I was like, this reminds, literally, that was the movie I was thinking of, the 19, early 1970s, Gene Hackman, the way that was shot, which has an, it, that has an inter interminable car chase in it, which was amazing mm -hmm. for its time. Mm -hmm. And then I hear Matt Reeves on a podcast afterwards where he literally says the French connection inspired the car chase. And I was like, I see it. I see what you yeah. were doing, but I love the Batmobile. I loved its function. I loved the, the kind of the climactic, like, uh Oh, he's in a lot of trouble with these tractor trailers turning over. And then he launches into the shot that we, gosh, I wish we hadn't seen that shot in the trailer now, because that would yeah, have been yeah. so effing cool to see yeah, for the yeah. first time on screen, him coming yeah. through the flames. But that set piece, piece was amazing it was gritty it was grounded it was everything we've been led to believe the last set piece was the opposite for me i didn't like when he drops into madison square garden or gotham garden gotham square garden that whole sequence where he's taken out the riddler's followers it reminded me too much of the dark knight when he goes into the building with the clowns and he's using the bat hook to kind of yank them all around and have them dangling everywhere and like I was like, it looks too much the same. This is mm -hmm. the first time where like, this is a little comic booky to me. And I don't know that I needed as much of it, um, yeah. given what you had spent two and a half hours to Already. kind of build up to. So I just didn't love the way that was handled. And I know Ian brought this up, you brought this up. It ties into one of my biggest, my if I had any complaint about Batman, it's that Batman's ability to withstand punishment is a little high for my taste. <laughs> yeah. So to, to recap, okay? So in the final set piece, he electrocutes himself with no impact. He takes a shotgun blast at like two foot range. Now he is dazed from it. Yeah. No blood, no shrapnel, no wounds. He literally pumps himself full of, well, we'll talk about what he pumped himself full of, of maybe, but there's something there, but adrenaline plus, let's call it. And he's fine. He is nose to nose with a bomb. I don't mean he's close to a bomb. He is got yeah. his cow right on there. a bomb that detonates in his face and he <laughs> flies across the room. Now, I understand he's got armor, but like, and I'm no scientist, but like, if that was in real life, we'd be like, oh, Here's the bat finger over here. Here's the bat foot over here. And that'd be the end of Batman. Okay. Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. now normally I don't have a huge problem with this, but when you go out of your way to say, this is the realistic Batman, they were stretching it. And you hit yeah. on the other one, which is when he lands on the bus yeah, yeah, at like yeah, full yeah. speed and bounces off. And he's like, Oh, I got like, a, I got to walk it off. I'm good. Like, tighten that up a little bit. He, does, he, yeah. he You can have a lot of cool action without him seeming like he's part Kryptonian, you know, some of the time. So yeah. I, I did, that was my, like, I do have one which is totally tongue-in-cheek, so I just had to do this because it's funny. Or well, I think it's funny. Maybe others won't, but does the Riddler's endgame actually make sense in this Gotham? So let me, <laughs> so let me throw this out from two angles. So number one, mm -hmm. We are led to believe that it rains 24-7, 365 <laughs> in this Gotham City. So would anyone really care if that city was flooded? Seriously. Is, there's water everywhere in this city. Yeah, like, but not, like, not, not, not to the extent, not to the extent oh, that it like, was at the end. Like, oh, I, I, a flood. It floods every night in this city. So anyway, it's yeah. kind of a joke, but like I'm just saying, like it'd be like someone coming to the desert and be like, I'm going to make it hot. And it's like... <laughs> It's I'm wet here it all the time. Hot. It's not hot. Yeah. It's super hot. <laughs> okay, so that's number one. Number two is if someone sent their crazed social media followers into the real Madison Square Garden to take out Nick's ownership and wash away the last 20 plus years of the stink of the Knicks, what fan actually is opposed to that? I'm serious. Yeah. Like, yeah. Are we actually have a problem with this? We'd be saying, let's put a question mark jersey in the rafters if we did that. <laughs> so those are the two problems with the Riddler's endgame. Well, I don't know that, that was this was actually so bad in, in all retrospect. So I'm totally tongue-in-cheek on that. But yeah. I did think about the rain thing because it's that one shot of Selena Kyle on her motorcycle. And she looks down and you see the flood starting around her boot. 
And yeah. but she kind of has a look on her face like, huh? Then she yeah. drives off like it's not a big deal. So anyway, yeah, yeah. but uh, those are not really a critique, but just sort of a uh, an, an observation. observation. But anyway, those, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I don't know if you had anything else, but those are my main ones. To me, I get what you're talking about with, with regards to all the Riddler uh, uh, goons. Um, yeah, that was that was a little bit like I've seen this before. It reminded me of that as well. Um, when he comes down and flies out, to me that looked dope. When he that was to cool. Me that, that was yeah, cool. That that part was dope. The other part, there was another part, um, and, and and I get where you're coming from from some of these other things too. But there was one part when the car is revving up when we first get introduced to the Batmobile, mm-hmm. and it seems to stall for a second. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. That would that was weird. Does. Yeah, it does, and I'm like, that was a weird choice to leave that in. Or, or to do it that way because it's sort of it's sort of a uh, it wasn't purposeful you know there wasn't a reason for it to stall or, and there wasn't a you know I, I don't understand the, the the decision to leave that in the movie you know what i'm saying so that that was a sort of that was that's quick that's nitpicking and stuff but um it's interesting. I guess I guess I had, I took it as it came from the same place as him having that moment of fear on top of the skyscraper. It's like Batman's got some kinks to work out in his in his arsenal. He's like we don't know how battle tested this Batmobile actually was for these type of situations. We know he used it because we know from the prequel novel he built it. But I guess I just interpret it as like it's a little it's one more piece of Batman's mortality that he's not perfect yet. That there's work to be done. The only way that would have you know, worked, Brian, if they would have cut to a reaction of him in the car and it stalls and he reacts to that. That would have worked for me better. That would have worked for me better. Um, So where do we go from here? Where do we want the story from? I'll say this, what he pumped himself up with, to me, that is possibly an introduction to a, a Bane um, and what he pumps himself up with, because it was the I think it was, it was a green was, substance, right? It was a green substance. We talked about substance. the complete lack of color in this movie. So the fact that that's one of the few things that was like a bright colored thing probably yeah. leads you to believe it means something. Yeah, um, and he gets kind of he gets kind of ornery, right? He doesn't just get energy from it; he gets angry. Like, oh, yeah, it's almost yeah. like he's like the Hulk for a little bit, like you know, exactly. Like, so. There's something in there, yeah. So, so I, I just thought that was interesting. But in terms of where we're going with this, I think this is going to leave lead to more um, discovery of his surroundings and specifically Gotham and how it's run. Um, ben, um, what's his name? Um, Robert Pattinson has already stated that he would like to see the Court of Owls. I think that's what we're going to be getting, Brian. It makes more sense to me. And this entail will sort of mold the Bruce Wayne that he needs to be in order to um, immerse himself in that, uh, uh, that part of the world. Because it's just not thugs and and you know, small criminal and crimes and stuff. This is, you know, this this big stuff that happens in these in the business world too. And he has to, you know, be involved some way and somehow. And he sort of has to, you know, not be Batman. He has to be Bruce Wayne, the suave dude, charismatic dude that that that's in all these circles and having conversations to find out to to that to me makes more sense. With the Joker and Riddler at the end, I don't know if we get this is going to be very interesting because I know they're supposed to be working on the Arkham series as well, Brian. Hmm. I don't know if, and, and to be honest, John Campbell come, came out with a, a very great idea of, of an anthology series of Ar- Arkham and each of these uh, episodes being dedicated to a specific um, character. Um, but I don't, I, I, I'm not... I think we've talked about it before. I'm not really interested in seeing the Joker portrayal right now. I, yeah. And being that is a trilogy, I don't, I don't know how it fits in. Uh, if we're if we're gonna go with the Court of Owls, how is the Joker gonna be involved, right? 
Brian, what are your thoughts on where we're going next with this? Uh, so I basically, I wrote, yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, I agree with you. Uh, no, no Joker yet is one of my keys for where we go from here. I don't want to see him in the second film. I, I am, as I said, I was disappointed in some ways. You know, nothing against Barry Keown, who's, who was my favorite part of Eternals. And, I, you know, not that I don't want to see his take on the character someday. But when you have the, you know, you have the Gotham series, you have the Penguin series, you have other ways to infer and introduce the Joker, that this movie didn't need to be the place to do it. And the other thing that I want to connect to here is my number one thing is, and this is the best thing I could say about this movie, which was called The Batman, is that I'm most interested to see where Batman goes from here, which is not often what you say about Batman movies yeah, yeah, and yet I think the number one thing the sequel has to do is I want to see Batman take a quantum leap in terms of his tech in terms of his efficiency as a ninja he's not really a ninja in this movie he really approaches everything kind of head on until the iceberg lounge deception at the very end but he basically knocks on doors he walks out of the tunnel right into the <laughs> middle of the bad guys fights his way through a club he's very much a frontal assault type of guy which yeah. we know in the comics, he ultimately is not. And so yeah. I want to see that. I want to see him become more of like a figure in the shadows who kind of wins by, you know, deception as much as by his, yeah. his strength. He, he fights when only necessary. Right. Yeah, yeah. We talked about his attention to detail as a detective and last and probably most important, his ability to connect, reconnect with humanity. I think that's the number one thing. Batman has to check all those boxes in the second film to really propel this series forward. That connects to why I don't want to see the Joker. To me, the Joker, he's the boss man, right? The clown prince of crime is the guy you, you want to bring in when it's prime Batman. So yeah. I want to see, if we're going to do this, I want to see the Joker opposite Batman when we feel like Batman is on top of the mountain and nobody else has a chance to approach him. Like he can solve anything, he can defeat, and then he comes up against the guy that is so unhinged, so brilliant, and so psychotic that he actually has to rethink everything he kind of knows. So I would, if they're going to do this and they only have three movies, I think Joker is a third movie villain. He's not a second movie villain for me. That then leads to where should we go? Court of Owls is where we should go. To me, yeah. the way we haven't talked about the way they set up the Waynes and the Arkhams and really gave a much different backstory to Bruce's parents and really kind of gave them some sins, which yeah. the, they typically don't, right? Typically, Thomas Wayne is like the best dad who's ever <laughs> walked the face of the earth, right? That's pretty much what he's portrayed yeah. as. So the fact that they're like, like, no, this guy, this guy, you know, it was a moment a week, but he made mistakes. He got it. He wanted to get in the public office and he made mistakes. He tried to cover some stuff up. I like that because it set, it opens the door for Court of Owls in a way that's like self-discovery. Like you kind of are learning who your parents really were when you yeah. didn't get to know them because they were taken from you. So I think that's where this movie should go. Now, the whole cameo with the Joker, there is a comics line, which is called the War of Riddles and Jokes, which basically the Riddler and the, the Joker escape and team up but kind of fight each other as much as they try to take that there's an basically it's like the joker ultimately decides he doesn't want to share he he wants to team up to take down batman and he's like nah but i gotta get the i gotta get the yeah. win and he takes he basically embarrasses and takes out almost takes out the riddler and so you kind of get this like triple threat match between the two of them and, and batman so that's a storyline that has been made and I, I, but I kind of hope to your point that they don't do it because it doesn't really fit with where we left this movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Matt Reeves talked about Mr. Freeze. Uh, I don't really know how he fits in what we've seen, but I guess I, I'm open to that. But Court of Owls yeah. is what I think makes the most sense. And I said this to you when Pattinson said it, like Pattinson has this penchant for kind of, you never know when he's lying and telling the truth in these interviews. And I think he's telling you the truth. I think that they know that's what they're going to do already. And He's literally just giving it to you. You just don't realize it's a spoiler. So that, that's where I hope we go with this. Yeah, because with the quarter of hours, man, what you're going to see is Batman having to really fight some dudes, like like really fight. He's not fighting regular dudes. Yes. You know, so nope. he really he's going to have to be on his A game when it comes to fighting. Um, and also him being another version of Bruce Wayne, which I hope they go in that route because he's going to need it. 
Um, so yeah, let's see. And th- you also put a note in the in the the show notes about the final uh, narration. If you saw the the beginning, well, if if you understood the and remember the the first part of his narration and the complete, uh, not not the complete. Um, I guess uh, uh, an extension of because there were how many narrations were there? There were three, at least three, no more than four. Yeah, the stuff that he says in these narrations, Brian, just gives me hope. And, and not to, not, it's not a pun or anything because that's sort of what he talks about at the end. Of, uh, of the film in terms of what he needs to be. And although the, I guess when, I think when Gordon asks the, the perp that was um, dressed in the Riddler gear, he asks him, who are you? And he says, I'm Vengeance. I just, it was corny, right? But I understood why it was said. It needed to be said. The reason being for Batman to understand that he just can't be Vengeance. Yep. Because vengeance can come in so many other forms, not just his, but crazy dudes like this that, that yep. feel the need that they need vengeance and, that, and, and are willing to do anything to, to get it, even if it means hurting other people. <clears throat> so he realizes that he needs to be something more. more. Um, but his fan, final narration gives me that hope that, that he is changing and that when we see him the next time, he is going to be a different Batman um, and hopefully we get to see how different he is. Um, your final thoughts on, um, uh, on that narration. Yeah, you hit on it. I mean, <laughs> vengeance was clearly the most important word to this movie. It was said more than any other word in this movie. I would suspect there'll be a different Jesus. word. That, yeah, there'll be a different <laughs> word that defines the second movie. I don't yeah. know if we get all the way to inspiration. That's clearly kind of where this is headed, but I don't know if you mm-hmm. can make that leap in one movie from where he is. So the, I'm very yeah. fascinated to see what's the middle ground where he, yeah. you know, he retains some of that anger and retains some of that fear factor, but he integrates a little more of that connection to humanity and, you know, taking that extra moment to attend to whether it's Alfred or a stranger, you know, their, their emotional need for hope. Or something beyond, you know, just okay. You got the job done. You move, move right on. So, no, I think I think you're right. That's what I say. Like the number one thing for where to from here is the growth of Batman and Bruce, Bruce Wayne. And so, and I think that's some of the best praise you can give this movie because we've we Bruce Wayne has usually been the least interesting character in his own movies historically. And so, I think this movie has managed to flip that around and say he's yeah. the most interesting character. Um, and where he goes from here is what we want to see most. So, no, I think that I think you're absolutely absolutely right about that. Um, overall film rating, Brian. What 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 do you give it? Um, so I'll officially give it four and a half. If I could give it four and three quarters, I would. Um, I you know it's close. I still think the dark Knight is the, still the best Batman film for me. And I think it's just because I Yikes. think I still think it's the best one because wow. I think it's at the end of <clears throat> I gave it for three reasons. I think the ledger performance gives it a lead. That's tough to catch. The editing is a bit tighter and I think it's a little more crowd pleasing at points. Uh, um, and so that's that con- those three things it's close, but I, to me, that's a five star movie. Like that's if I'm giving five stars to a comic book wow. movie, that's a five star movie. So that's why I say this is like a four and three quarters. This is my number two. This def, to me, I I like this one better than the Burton film in 1989. I think this is a better movie than that. They're very different, but I think this is a better movie than the Burton film. Um, who a lot of people probably might still keep as their their number two or maybe even their number one. But yeah, it's close. But I think it's it's but. If I'm being fair, this is definitely better than Batman Begins, right? If we're really comparing apples to apples, the real question might be: Is the sequel to this movie better than The Dark Knight? Because that's I think really we keep the it. I think that's what I, right? Yeah, yeah, that is a fair. So that's kind of where I'm at with this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, Batman Begins for me has some great Batman moments. That's a that's a great Batman origin film. 
But oh, this yeah. one is better than that one. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is th this this Batman? Let's do that. Let's compare this Batman. Let's uh, let's not just compare it to all the Batman is it, that there's ever been on the onset uh, of the introdu reintroduction of a Batman. So uh, 89 character. Batman, Batman Begins, this Batman, I would have this number one. This Batman, yes, yes, yes. Definitely, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so you're, are you giving it the full five? Oh, snap, yeah. I forgot to give my, my rating. Nah, I, I'm going to do uh, four out of five. I, four? I, yeah, yeah, because I think... <laughs> yeah, I think to me... The Didn't you give Super Black Widow four? No, no, Black Widow. I thought, you did. Nah. I thought you did. Oh, okay. We got to go back to the tape. We yeah, go back I got to the tape. I'm shocked <laughs> that I gave a higher rating than you did. Nah, nah, nah. Um, any final thoughts, Brian? You know, I love that it just worked out this way, but I love that we got Spider Man No Way Home and the Batman as like our back to our, our back to back superhero tentpole movies because they couldn't be more different yeah and they're both awesome for very different reasons and that's where this is the moment where you're like the genre is still in a good place and still putting out content that is different and original and fun and a reason to get you to go to the movies because like i said I, I can't think of a bigger contrast between no way home and this movie and yet i gave i think i gave both films four and a half stars and they, they earn those four and a half stars for me in different ways. And it's just like, that's a testament to the filmmakers who, who put them together. So that's my final take is like, it just shows you there's more than one way to win in this genre. And I think you're right that like, what this movie accomplished will start something. I think you will see more of this being attempted, which is like, hey, we don't need to, we don't need to check the formulaic boxes. We can yeah. do it our way and as long as we execute it at a high level with the right people people are going to come out want to see it want to see it again they're going to tell their friends to go see it so yeah it, it, it was awesome yeah. yeah um just to be clear my number one superhero movie is still the winter soldier that is my five right there that is my five okay you gotta you gotta get to that to be a five for me Okay. Uh, and then stuff like Endgame and Infinity War 4.5, close to five almost in those in that range. So to me, the Dark Knight is um, well, not Dark Knight. Um, uh, the yeah. Batman is a four. Um, but yeah, that's our show for today. Please let us in. A, let us know in the comment section below what you thought of this film. Do you agree or disagree with some of the stuff that we had to say about this film? Um, let us know in the comments section below. Hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Share with your friends. Start a conversation. Um, we'll see you next time on The Nerd Generation.